Oh, wow. I really can't believe that something like this exists. First, before I get into this, there would be some minor spoilers because there are a lot of things that I thought about while watching this anime that I wrote down that I included in the reviews. So, yeah. Kind of hard to reference things that happen like in episode 6 or 7 without spoiling anything. But I'm going to try to keep spoilers as minor as possible so that if you want to watch this afterwards, you won't be spoiled. Though, I really don't think you want to watch this after my review. Anyway, typically when I review a bad show, there was a time when I thought that it could be really good. There's something about it that was able to really draw me and make me want to see where they would take the story. Like, Tokyo Ghoul had a wonderful start with the horror elements. Out of Noah had some interesting conflicts and battles, not to mention cool music. And Red Book Keaton had weird mysteries that really drew me in and make me think it could be a really exciting mystery show. With Big Order, though, the best I can see is that the first episode was kind of okay. The concept of people having powers and using them to take over the world had been done before, though it could certainly be done in a different way. Though the first episode was played by Forrest Mister as it kept teasing us about what Eiji's wish was, and that ended up making it feel really annoying. Okay, before I get into this too much, let's go over the basics of the story. There are people in this world called Orders who have a power that corresponds to a wish that they made. Our main character Eiji having the power to control anything and anyone within his domain. When he made his wish, he somehow caused the great destruction which killed either millions or billions of people depending on the scene when they talk about it, so he does the natural thing and tries to lay low and not have anyone know what he did. Though some people end up finding him and kind of force him to lead a resistance against the oppressive government or something with some plot details that I actually kind of forgot. As I said, the overall concept does sound cool, if not completely original. So what ends up making the show fascinating is how the show proceeds to go downhill in the most spectacular way I have ever seen. A.G. is joined by a girl named Ren who wants to kill him, and she is also kind of the love interest, which I must say is a unique combination. We haven't seen anything quite like that since school days. A.G., doing the logical thing that someone wants to kill him, puts her under his control and instructs her not to hurt him or his sister. Oh yeah, A.G. has a sister, she's in bad health, remember this for later. Back to Ren though, when A.G. puts her under his control, he also had something about her marrying him for no reason whatsoever, so that is why Ren has a conflicting desire to love him and kill him. In episode 2, they're basically trying to escape from the rebels' enemy base. Ren constantly tries to indirectly kill A.G. because apparently that would not go against the orders, but every time she does so, she ends up the one being hurt, typically in a way that would be fatal, but she has a power to automatically heal so she doesn't actually die. And this is just played off for comedy, which is really odd for a show like this, which is so serious, especially in this part. I'm not saying you couldn't include some comedy later on, just not in this scene. And then there's also her grinding on him because we need a fan service or something. Again, we'll get back to this point later. And then you also have A.G. trying to encourage her, which really seems odd considering she just tried to kill him. But yeah, I guess A.G. is such a good person because I personally would not try to encourage someone who's killing me earlier, or at least trying to. So maybe I'm just not as good a person as A.G. is, or something. And then we see that the rebels have captured A.G.'s sister, have frozen her time, and are using her as a sort of hostage for A.G. to become their leader to create a new nation. So then A.G. uses his order to take control of all of the leaders of the rebels, basically. So... Does anything here make any sense at all? If so, don't worry, it won't later on. A.G. is one of the most powerful protagonists I have ever seen. Heck, he might even be able to beat Saitama as Saitama entered his domain, A.G. takes control, and then Saitama cannot punch him. And then if Saitama cannot punch him, he's basically useless. With a character like this, it's hard to come up with threats that actually seem threatening, or they need to find some way to limit his powers, which normally just feel cheap. For example, one of the enemies can't control others, even though A.G. already has controlled them, and A.G. can't take control back because they are wearing headphones. Or they fire a nuclear missile at him, and while it is shown that A.G. can manipulate inanimate objects or things like air pressure and gravity, he he apparently can't have the missile just not explode by commanding the nuclear fission not to happen, and his control's gravity is limited so it only does a little bit good, but just enough good to stop the missile. It seems like a lot of the other characters have arbitrary limits placed on their powers too, just to keep the plot going depending on what type of power they need. Like Eo has a power to divine the future that is sometimes really specific and other times being vague or just useless as a whole. Or we have one character who can make things untrue but having a time limit set on this. Why couldn't he use the power on himself to make it so he no longer has a limit? Or for that matter, why can't A.G. use his powers to cure his sister's sickness, like tell the disease to go away? And how that Dimension Sword guy know exactly where to attack and how to aim perfectly with his big attack in Episode 8? And why couldn't his Dimension Sword work well in close range? And how did A.G. know that one work well in close range? And then there are just a lot of things that never felt like they got the proper explanation. Like the destruction A.G. caused by making his wish. Like, how did that work? Like, were there explosions everywhere? Were there massive earthquakes? Was the meteors falling from the sky? Like, we don't know. We just know that tons of people died. And we also never really got an explanation for how his dominion worked. Is it just everywhere near him who's under his domain, or is it like his domain can be spread wherever he goes nearby? Which actually seems like the more likely option, but then there are times where he wanted to get one character in his domain, but she kept moving, so why couldn't he like put the whole area under his domain so she would have nowhere to go? And then there were also the things that just make no sense at all, like Ia who became pregnant after Eiji touched her ribbon because she is a Miko. 
whatever the heck that is. Except it turns out she wasn't really pregnant, and yeah, I just don't have words for this one. And then there's also the fact that EO seems to be more concerned with being with AG than getting out of situations alive. Because really, if you want to be with someone, both you and him have to be alive. And then why did EO even go with AG in episode 6? Like, why not send someone who could be more useful in combat, like a small team of soldiers, one of the other orders or something? And then where did this robe appear from after they got wet? And then just this next, like, why, I, why, what is wrong with you? The light and the, the just... No? <sighs> and then there's also this long incident later where Eiji does something so stupid it makes no sense how it could help him to accomplish his goal at all. Granted, it really doesn't actually have any impact in the end, so maybe it's not that bad of a thing, but still, like, why did you do that? That just, that's dumb. And then we also have the main villain, who they tried to reveal with a big plot twist, but that just had no impact whatsoever because of how bad the rest of the story had been. They also tried to justify the fantasy aspects of the show with science in a way that made absolutely no sense, even after they tried to add things about, like, spiritual ley lines and such. And then what does this gate anyway, and, like, how does reverse pentagram and all that come together? And they do kind of explain some of this, but I think at the point near the end, it's like they were having so many things happen, I could not tell if they made sense or not. We also have dialogue that just felt completely wrong. Like, one character would say something, and another character would say something else, but it did not feel like a natural reply to what the first character said, but it was just, like, move the plot along. And then there's also the fact that we have so many characters here that I have no idea who half of them were half the time. Like, we know A.G., Ransan, and a couple of the others. We get enough time with them to get to know who they are. But all these others we barely see, which makes the story kind of hard to follow, and I just don't care about the characters. This is not helped by the fact that there are only 10 episodes, which is normally hard to tell a complete story with, especially when you try and make it as complicated as this one. I also had trouble with following who was who and who was on which side, especially with some things that were happening about two-thirds of the way through the show. Maybe this would work better if they actually spent more time developing the plot instead of having a fan service for several minutes. And the fan service really just seemed super out of place for a generally serious story. Episode 5 had the girls probably spend five minutes in a hot springs groping each other with tons of beams of light for censorship. Heck, the censorship is as bad as Tokyo Ghoul, and that's saying something. Normally, I can look past the censorship and sometimes I'm even grateful for it, but in the case of this show, there's one scene that's hard to really see what's actually going on here. Like, I can understand, like, blurring some of the things having some steam, but when I can't tell what's going on because there are beams of light everywhere, then, well, that's bad. It also felt like the fan service was added just to give people a reason to buy the DVD so that they could see the uncensored version because people are not going to buy the show for the story, that's for sure. And because they needed to appeal more to people's fetishes for the show, they decided why not throw a lobe of incest in. No, really, this anime studio decided to add incest to the story with Eiji and Senna because it just was not... No. Oh, but don't worry. They're not really blood related. A fact that was announced about two minutes before we're shown a room with her clothes thrown everywhere and this type of relationship just came out of nowhere. Heck, at least Super Lovers tried to show the progression before it went to this level. And then there was also that attempted rape scene, which just, no. Trying to make a show seem like dark and edgy and serious, but having rape in it just, that completely backfires. Like, it's insulting even. So, yeah, that's bad. And now moving on to production values and, yeah, okay. Animation, not bad. Much notable here, and if the story was decent, I probably wouldn't have much to say either. I'd say, yeah, it was okay, and yeah. The only really notable thing about the animation was episode 10 where they had most of it in black and white except for like the uh, one thing being colored. And I did think that was a cool effect, but it ended up being used for too much of the show to really improve it any. The music though is actually kind of interesting because there are scenes in the beginning where they would play a real upbeat song during a more somber serious scene and it just didn't work. Normally I'm not one to complain about music being bad in a show, at best I might say it was unremarkable, but in this case the music choice was bad. Though I will admit it does get better throughout the series, and I think as episode 5 had a cool battle with neat music playing so that was neat. Though yeah, as a whole, nothing exceptional about the music either. Again, not bad overall, but yeah, nothing to save the show. And I am not going to say there are not any good things about the show. Some of the themes about the power of hate and how they're explored are kind of interesting, and the story's concept is not a bad one. Sen is also an interesting character, at least for a few episodes. I wish that she had more of a role throughout the story because that could be something really cool to see. Actually, I would prefer it if she was the main character, especially taking into account like she only has a few months to live, so how is she going to use the position she's in to basically make the change she wants in the world? But yeah, that's pretty much everything for me. For an overall score, I'm going to give this a 1.5 out of 10, which yes, this is the lowest score I've ever given a show, and yeah, for good reason. The story is a complete mess. The characters are mostly unlikable. A couple of them are decent, and some of them do get a little bit of development, but not that much. There's also like the fan service, the incest, and the attempted rape just destroy any good that the show might have had, at least for me. And yeah, so rating, skip it. 
because that should be obvious. Uh, for recommendations though, I'm going to first of all recommend Code Geass because, well, it feels very similar in a lot of ways and Code Geass basically did everything here better. For the second recommendation, the obvious one might be Mirai Nikki because it's like the same manga, a lot of similar concept, but I've not seen Future Diary and yeah, that'd just be going off what other people said. Some people like it, some people hate it, so maybe give it a try? I don't know. Instead, for a recommendation for me, I am going to go with Gintama, because after watching something like this, you're going to want to purge your mind with some type of comedy, and well, Gintama's been a really good comedy that I've enjoyed watching lately. So, go give that a try, and I'll see you in like five years when you finally get caught up. But yeah, that's everything for me today. Hope you enjoyed this review. It's kind of fun to make reviews about shows like this. So please like, comment, subscribe if you feel like it, and I will talk to you next time.